can survive if I let you. Let the new era begin. The era of the ECW. Oh my god. Greetings ECW fans and welcome to This Is Extreme, the ECW History Podcast. I am your host, Dave Dynasty. Thank you for joining us for another episode. We have another great interview lined up for you today. We have uh, ECW referee Jim Molyneux on, uh, one of, I think only two guys, who was with ECW from the very beginning to the very end. Uh, of course, it was uh, Jim and uh, his referee cohort, John Finnegan, who we had on an earlier episode. Uh, they were both with the company from the beginning of the Eastern days all the way through to the closing of the company. So a great interview with Jim coming up in just a bit. Not a whole lot of news to cover before we get there. Uh, everything seems to be uh, quiet on the extreme front for the most part. Uh, make sure you are following me on social media. The the commercial will be coming up. Uh, do that. You can follow me personally on X at the Dave Dynasty. That is probably your, your central means to follow me and all the podcasts that I do is to follow that account. All right. So once again, thank you for joining us. Make sure you subscribe to us on your favorite podcast platform, but let's take a quick break. And when we come back, we'll have that interview with Jim Molyneux. So stick around. Be sure to follow This Is Extreme on all social media platforms. You can find us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Just search for ECW Pod. Be sure to follow us Keep up to date and join in the discussions. We want to hear your feedback, so find us on all the social media platforms and join the revolution. This is extreme. All right, we're back on This is Extreme, and I'm being joined now by an ECW referee who is there through the entire run of the promotion, Jim Molino. Jim, how are you? Very good. How are you? I am good. Let's let's start. The first question I always like to ask people is. How did you become a fan of professional wrestling? Uh, probably the same answer you get from everybody else. When, you know, Saturday afternoon watching it with my dad. Um, you know, my my dad was a weekend warrior uh, with uh, motorcycle racing. Mm -hmm. So, um, but he wouldn't race as much as as help run them. Uh, he was in a a racing club, not a motorcycle club, a racing club. He made sure we knew the difference. <laughs> and and they would do enduro races through the woods against other teams. Just, you know, follow the arrow and make your own path. Um, and all the guys on the team, most of them had apartments except for us. We, we had the house with a garage. So all the motorcycles were in our garage. So there was more tinkering than anything in our house with the bikes. And so he would tinker on Saturday morning. And when it was time for wrestling, clean up, come on in, watch wrestling, go back out to the bikes. Um, but yeah, that that was how I started. That's, you know, in the round way, that's, I guess, the way most people start. Yeah, you grew up in the Northeast, right? So was it, I mean, were you were you New York? Is that what you were watching? Uh, New York, yeah. I was watching yeah. the Philadelphia feed. Yeah. Um, so when did you decide, hey, this is something I want to I want to get into, that I'd like to become involved with it? It wasn't until I was 20, 27 or 28. Um, twenty. I was 28 when I did my, my first match. So I started kind of late. And what it was, was I, I just, I got away from it for a while. Uh, grow, the, growing up in the Philadelphia area, be, became a huge hockey fan. So I was playing hockey a lot. Uh, and in fact, at, at that age, I was still playing hockey in a ball hockey league, outdoor ball hockey league. So I was really tied up with that. Um, and I guess, you know, by the teen years, I got away from it because I wanted to to play guitar and play in a band. And, and, you know, I think a lot of people do have that mm -hmm. kind of dream, too. So <laughs> came to the point where I realized that no matter what I did, I wanted to entertain. I, I did some acting in high school and things like that. So I wanted to entertain people somehow. And um, I went to the Great American Bash, uh, 1987. I think that's what it was, 87. And uh, it was a the main event wasn't this, but this is the match I remember the most: a double bull rope match with um, Dusty Rhodes and Ron Garvin against um, Ric Flair and Tully Blanchard. Yep. And I was in the third row, and I'm like, man, this is great. I got to figure out a way to get involved. And I listened to the ring announcer, and it was Joel Goodhart. 
Yeah. And he oh, had yeah. started the fan club. They had the fan mm-hmm. club and the radio show going, but he hadn't started TWA yet. Um, so I went and found a place to train. I wanted to be a manager because I knew I, I, there's no way I can be a wrestler, a fat little guy at <laughs> five foot nine who has a, can jump about six inches off the ground. <laughs> so there's, there's no way I'm, I'm going to be a, a wrestler. And I was, I was a bit of a wise guy growing up. So I thought, yeah, maybe I can get away with, you know, a smart mouth. So I started training to be a manager and did a couple of shows, created a character, the extravagant Jimmy fortune. And I was going to have what my, my group of guys that were going to be called the agents of fortune, uh, which is, was a blue oyster cold album, a huge blue yeah. oyster cold fan. So, um, so then I went to Goodhart who had by now had started TWA and had about a year under the belt with him. And I said, um, you know, hey, I'm I'm interested in coming in. Can can you know? You think you can use me? And and we were friends. It wasn't you know just out of nowhere. And he was like, well, I don't need another manager, but I could use another referee. And he he gave me the sale of, of you know the used carsman sale of of mm-hmm. being a referee. And he said, um, you know, think about it for a couple of days and give me a call back. Um, so I thought about it and I called him back ten minutes later and said, yeah, I'm in. And I was down there, the that was like a, a Thursday night or a Friday night. And I was, next thing I know, I was Tuesday, I was training. I was in a ring for the first time. And I trained for about eight weeks before I went and actually had ref to for my first match. Yeah, and TWA, obviously kind of the predecessor to, to ECW. Yeah. Um, so so what was it like working there, right? Because there was, there, again, there was a lot of similarities, a lot of things carried over. But, but Joel, man, he did some... Huge shows. I mean, brought yeah. in some huge talent. Probably too big, right? That's kind of his downfall was, you know, he... Yeah, it was. If, if, if things didn't, you know, if he wasn't drawing when he needed to draw, he was he was losing the money. Um, so what was it like working for TWA? Because they had a lot of attention at that time. Right. Yeah, we were, they were getting a lot of... We were getting a lot of attention. What we do is, you know, on... on he would do those big shows that you're talking about um, three times a year. Mm-hmm. At, at the Philadelphia uh, Civic Center, one of the exhibition halls, not at the big arena where the NWA ran. Um, so he would do those about three times a year. The rest of the year, we would do local show, high schools, rec centers, the typical indie setup, and would bring one or two guys in, uh, former WWE, former NWA, uh, a, a recognizable name. Um, but we were also building a good group amongst ourselves. We, you know, we had guys who were known on the independent circuit, DC Drake, Larry Winters, uh, Tony Stetson, Johnny Hotbody, guys who were well-known local. Plus we were building out of our, our school, uh, out, of, out of Joel's school. So we had a good mix of, of guys that could put on a show when, you know, just add a name for attraction. And then, be able to be a part of the big shows that we did at the uh, Civic Center with a lot of big names at it. Yeah, and like we said, I mean that essentially TWA led ECW, right? A lot of those same guys went over, right? I believe was was Todd was I, Todd was he a sponsor in TWA? Was he sponsoring some stuff? Right? He had some he had some involvement in, in there. Where were you when when, when Tri State folded? Right, because obviously they, I, I believe it kind of hinged on that uh, the the Nature Boy versus Nature Boy show, right? Where yes. they uh, they had this huge show, didn't draw like they wanted. I mean, it, Joel, it was kind of an all of a sudden thing, right? Where well, he, he he realized that he was they weren't going to they were going to lose a shit ton of money. Can, are we cursing yeah. on this? Yeah, 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 yeah. Say whatever you want. Yeah, uh, he was losing. Going to know he knew he was going to lose a lot of money. Um, yeah, so that's why he pulled the show, and and it was a shame because it was a. Other than the, everyone thinks of that main event, uh, Buddy Landell against Buddy Rogers, but also he was going to have Williams and Gordy mm-hmm. against Furness and LaFont, which a lot yeah. of people forget about. And that would have been the only time that it happened in the U.S. Yeah. Was, otherwise, that was an all big all Japan match. Um, and I, I would have sold a child to do that match. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And like um, I said, out, out of those ashes, right? Like Larry Winters and some of those guys went and talked to Todd. About about hey let's man we've got something right mm-hmm. there's there's enough here where were you at all around those talks when it was happening no when they were- I, I wasn't 
Uh, I was told, um, keep stand by. We're, we're, we're trying to put something together. Yeah. Um, and, and really the people that were putting it together or involved in, in talking to, to figure a way to make it happen were, were Todd, Larry Winters, Bob Artis, who was our right. ring announcer. Right. And, and John Finnegan was involved too, who refereed with me the entire time of ECW. Yeah. And, and he, John actually trained me. So John was kind of in on set, helping set things up. Yeah, and Todd did right. He he, he went and like I said, it was there was a lot of that same talent that flowed over. But but Todd did have he had a little more business, you know, mindset, right? He he knew yeah. a little, had a little sensibility to know hey when the limit is right. And um, so you know he built did build off the back of TWA, started Eastern Championship Wrestling, right? Which you were there, right? And it mm-hmm. flowed over. Um, so what was it like in those early days? Because because Larry, I think Larry booked just a show or two, but then they pretty quickly brought in Eddie Gilbert, correct, to, to book. Well, he until we got the TV deal, it was Larry who was the booker. Right. Uh, Eddie came when they decided they they wanted they were able to get local TV um, bigger than who we actually had a local TV before what everybody knows is East Eastern, um, where I think it was like a, a five block radius from this <laughs> television station. Yeah. And everything that we did at the old uh, Philadelphia sports bar. Mm-hmm. was right. recorded and that became that show um uh, and then when it was time we actually did a pilot to go to the local at the time philadelphia sports channel it was called mm-hmm. yeah um we we did a pilot and larry was was the booker for that and they had brought in i know they brought in ivan Koloff and terry taylor they may have brought in a, another neighbor too plus all of us local guys um that's what sold the show to to the television station and after that somewhere in there todd decided he wanted to go with someone who had more experience with television which i think was a shame because larry did have a lot of experience with television and i think we could have would have stayed on a a path that we were already on where eddie kind of led us in another path not that it was a wrong path but it led us in a different way and we had to kind of reset a little bit um yeah and and eddie brought in a lot of his people that he could trust just like yeah. any booker yeah uh, paulie did the same thing yeah and obviously eddie brought in a lot of memphis influence right because he eddie you know came through memphis was a memphis fan jerry lawler he was addicted to jerry lawler right wanted to be jerry right. lawler and uh so what was it like there when, when eddie was booking could you see that could you see did anybody ever feel hey is this guy just trying to make us memphis light or or what was <laughs> what was the what was the mindset while eddie was booking there you know, it wasn't that different from from Larry's mindset. Larry was a, a northeastern version of of Memphis TV. If yeah. you ever look it up, the the old NWF that Larry was involved in with with mm-hmm. Drake, yeah. um, that was the kind of you know look at those matches, and they used a lot of the same guys, or or they even did like the same stipulations of matches, just plugged in their you know guys, their 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 Jerry Lawler and their Eddie Gilbert and their Austin Idol. Um, so a lot of it was still based on, on the Memphis theory. So it wasn't that far off. Um, Eddie would come in, have three weeks worth of TV written down, put it up on the wall. And that was it. That that was what we were doing. And then obviously, right. Eddie left, right. I I believe he went to Puerto Rico or whatever. And then, and, and Paul Heyman started booking. Yes. And what was, what was the difference there? Right. Because. Oh. Like you said, you, you said Eddie would have three weeks. There was at least some mindset, but everybody always talks about Paul was much more by the seat of his pants. Let's yeah. <laughs> who was here? Okay. Freelance. <laughs> there you go. Right. A little, a little free flow in the thoughts. Uh, was it, was it jarring when, when, because obviously Paul was also bringing in some New York guys, right. So, and, and using it, you know, obviously like anybody, like you said, like any booker will, but there was some new talent being, in. like, was it, was it jarring at all in the locker room when this change happened? Yeah, no, I don't think so. I think it maybe it was more jarring with the Memphis people who came in uh, than it was the New York people, because a lot of the New York people we knew from independence and and already, you know, had, had some familiarity with them. Taz, Tommy Dreamer, guys like that. Some of us had worked independent shows and, and knew them. Yeah. So it, it wasn't that jarring. The, the most jarring, like you said, Paulie being free fa- freelance or, or, or free form with his booking. Um, would have a basic idea of the the main event and maybe the, the couple semis. Um, but otherwise, he'd look around the room, see, he'd come in, put his stuff down, get out his notebook, look who's around, uh, 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 
put him with here, here, here. <laughs> there are times where, you know, it's 8.15, and Paul, we need a match to start the show. <laughs> so we, we'd get a match, and, and, the, and, you know, a referee would go out, and we're sitting there still waiting for the other <laughs> matches. To, yeah. You know, but Paul was different because he would – he would edit differently than Eddie. Yeah. You know, Ed, Eddie would pretty much whatever was written down with Eddie, you know, match one. Well, that was the first match that week. Match two, that was it. You know, Paul would just throw the matches out there, make sense with the crowd, and then play with them for TV. Yeah. And Paul, I mean, Paul was a genius with the editing stuff, right? He he, he oh, knew yeah. how to, uh, to edit to make guys look even – shine even more than they did right he knew how to, to to edit those you know the mistakes the different things out to really get guys i mean guys over and uh i mean i guess paul understood his methods um but then like i said you know with his method things you know evolved from eastern right and then it got into extreme right it came there the, the shane douglas everybody's talked about that the throwing the title they mm -hmm. rebranded as extreme when that happened right and they went to the extreme whatever how as a referee how did that affect you? Because the role of the referee was not almost was not traditional anymore, right? The rules were obviously a little looser. There weren't the D as big, you know, DQs being called. Did you have how did you have to adapt? Or how did that affect you as a referee? Well, I, I I think when we were in the in the um before we became extreme while Paul was there, the the, the rules had become a little looser. Right. Yeah. Um so we weren't doing a lot of count outs and giving guys a chance to get back in the ring and, and you know seeing chairs or hearing chair, you know, however you want to look at it, letting things get a little wilder. Um, we were already in that process of doing that. And I, I think just the, the name change from Eastern to extreme um, was just to, to make us more uh, acceptable in other parts of the country because we were right. starting to get syndicated. We were, we were going to start going to other parts of the country. Yeah. A little less regional. Right. Show. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. I mean, who wants to see Eastern Championship Wrestling in Florida? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It, it, did it ever bother you, though, as a referee? That, that I mean, really, your roles kind of was, did you, were you ever, I don't know, it's odd to me to think, I, I've never refereed, right? But it's odd to me to think, what is your place in a match? <laughs> I mean, just to count the three, did, uh, how hard was it you to, to make that, uh, that uh, to adapt to that? Yeah, I, I never looked at it as all I'm there to do is count. Um, I'm there to, especially with ECW, um, some of the crazy crowds that we had, you know, it, your your eyes are on the match, but you're also watching and, and listening to the crowd. Yeah. Um, there might be a fight breaking out. So, hey, guys, if you want to you want to take it to a hold and let the fight happen, and once it's done, go on back to the match or do something to draw the people away from the fight <laughs> yeah, <laughs> or even going, going through the crowd, you know, keeping, we, we had to go, we went through the crowd. I don't know how many times we were keeping yeah. people away. Yeah. Um, the, you know, and, and thank God for security, not just uh, Atlas security, but the guys that we had before that, because yeah. they were keeping the fans away from the reps too. <laughs> they were, yeah. they were going to try to kill us. <laughs> yeah. And there's obviously even, even prior, I mean, Coming out of East, there was obviously something special, right? It had a, a feel. You could tell things were clicking, right? Things were happening. Um, did, could, could you feel that? Obviously, guys talk about that in the locker room, right? That they felt, hey, there's something happening here. Right. When, when did do you have a timetable at all when you noticed that, man, there's this is unique? Um, I think when we became extreme and, and started going to other places, um that was like wow we're we're getting into the 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 big league um you know area where you know i'm not going to be home tonight <laughs> you know where if, if you're local and you're regional you're you're pretty much home every night yeah um but this was different this was like wow we're we're on the road and not that we we're on the road as much as wwe or, or wcw we i mean we were still home for most of the week but wow we're we're going away we're going somewhere we're we're showing people what we're doing and and they seem to like it i i think once we you know when we got a positive crowd reaction from other parts of the country that's when i think we really you know meshed and started bolting forward yeah 
one thing that always I've always marveled at is Paul. Paul had this weird finger on the pulse of pop culture and music. It right. was it was so unique to me how he he knew what music to use. It, it's mm-hmm. almost like he was one step ahead of what was hot. Right. And, uh, and obviously he knew how to tap into something when it became hot. But he it, it, did that. Was that uniquely Paul? Or was there other guys giving influence the same thing? How do you have any insight on it? I mean, how did he know? Yeah, I I don't know how he knew. I I always compared ECW to the band Nirvana. So, you know, you know, we're we shot up real fast and you know, boom, we were done. Yeah. One you know, once once the, the money ran out and everything, you know, it was done. The same with Nirvana, all the way to the top, boom, the bottom falls out. Um, but yeah, I don't know where he got that influence or, or whether he had someone on the inside of music world's going, Hey, here's the next big thing coming out from, you know, someone, the, you know, this band or that band, I, I think it'll, you know, and if they were a fan, they'd go, Oh, it could fit with this, or I see what you're doing on TV here. Try this. Yeah. Well, I mean, Paul had a background in like in clubs and stuff. So I don't right. know if it's just that, that same sensibility and, uh, that, you know, carried over, I, it was. It was yeah, always it been unique to me, yeah. And uh, and like you said, I mean, to me, ECW is just synonymous synonymous with with the nineties, right? It, it is so because it it came up in the early nineties, and by you know whatever by two thousand one, it was gone, right? And it it, it it so it ran the course of the nineties, and when you look at it in the music and the in the style and that you know the extreme and everything, it, it was so it fits so perfect in that decade. I don't know, I don't think it could ever happen in another time period, obviously. No, it it just and I don't think something time. like that'll happen again. It is, mm. you know, it was lightning in a bottle, and I don't think that there's going to be any kind of new wave of wrestling um, that's that would you know draw the the attraction of you know that many people. And I mean, it was obvious, it was so trendsetting because I mean, I mean, you know, WWE, WCW, they followed suit, right? They what ECW was doing. I mean, ECW spawned the Attitude area. Yeah. And um, and it was so trendsetting. It, it it totally changed the course of the business. And um, when obviously you know Paul's in booking, but there came that point where then the also the ownership changed from Todd to Paul. Um, did the locker room have any sense of that? Did any feel of that? I know Todd was still around, right? A little after that, and in that you know the commissioner role was still. So did I mean was it? I know that there's a, maybe a different name on the checks, right? The, the, whatever, HHG or whatever it was, yeah. Yeah. Paul's group. And uh, so, I mean, was that all there was or did, did it for a while at least, did it just kind of feel like the, the same business as usual? No, I, I thought it, I, I felt a step back a little bit. Um, you know, I, I know, you know, our, the leadership was still Paul and it was his idea. We were following the whole time, but I, before that, I felt, you know, Todd, uh, Todd was able to, to, you know, get a couple things in say, Hey, why don't you try it? You know, maybe we could do this with, you know, always pushing his guys. So like salmon, yeah. let's do this with salmon. Um, but you know, I, I kind of felt that there was a little bit of the air let out of the bag with that because he, he did start it. And, and, you know, if it wasn't, wasn't for Todd, we wouldn't be talking right now. Yeah. And I, and I, and I talked to pa- ta- Todd and, um, he, like I've said, he he had the business background, right? He he knew how he ran a business, right? His family had yeah. ran a business for a long time, and I I feel like one of the first nails in the coffin was when that that kind of that change happened, and you lost Todd Gordon, trying to be able to keep it pulled back and grounded a little bit, and, and try to say, oh, we can't do that. That's too much, too much of a step. Yeah. Business wise, we got to be smart because then once it was all on Paul, suddenly Paul's just let's go, go, go. And we'll deal with the fallout after we're, we're, we're I think. Right. Todd, and, and I feel like that's where, again, Paul's a creative genius, but business wise, not so much. Right. And, and when you, that's what worked with him and Todd to me, there was the balance, the creative, and the business. And right. when you lost that with Todd's influence, I believe that's kind of where things started to maybe unravel a little. Yeah, I, I think so. I think that if we had stayed, not stayed Eastern, but gone extreme and, and stayed a little more regional than, than we did, um, travel wise, I think we probably could have supported ourselves a little bit better as a company. Um, you know, we're not flying everybody in to, you know, wherever, um, you know, and maybe if we did fly people into Chicago and Detroit or whatever, 
um, maybe use a little more of the local talent to support the lower end of the the, the show. Mm-hmm. And that would, you know, save a little money here and there. But, you know, Paul, give it to him, Paul and Tommy. I, I think Tommy spoke up probably about this to Paul more than anything to, to be loyal to the guys who've been there. Yeah, sure. And well, and there was that unique situation of, right, Paul couldn't give everybody a contract and, and keep things in. So he had to give them dates, right? He had to, to keep them working, to keep them in the company. You know, he had to get these guys yeah. dates to try to keep them there. I never had a contract. I, I was mm-hmm. handshake from day one. Right. And, and yeah, and some of these guys, though, like you said, if they were if they were using local talent, and they're only getting one, two dates a week, as right. opposed to three or four. Obviously, they're going to have to supplement and who knows what will happen there. Um, it, You know, it's, it's it's kind of that weird scenario of where they fell in the time period. Right. They're coming out of the territories, coming into, you know, it, ECW kind of overlapped and had to deal with some of the pluses and minuses of of two mindsets. Yeah. And um, and then obviously there's there's barely illegal, right? The first ECW pay per view, and there's this has been talked about and dissected just <laughs> oh, over and over and over, and uh, and it romanticized even, right? And I'm not saying some of it's not justified, but from your standpoint on that day, what what was it like? Um, it was crazy for me. Uh, it was it was almost like you know an actor getting ready for their first Broadway debut or or something like that, and. I just, you know, we had a check-in at 1230 just to make sure everybody was in town, that everybody met, okay, go have dinner, go get some sleep, whatever you want to do. I live 15 minutes away. I didn't feel like going home. I wanted to sit and take it all in because mm-hmm. maybe I'll never do it again. Sure. Um, so I just sat around and watched them finish setting up the lights and painting this and, <laughs> you know, testing the sound and, and taking it all in. Um and I think that kind of helped me uh, for down the line behind the scenes um, with with wrestling. Um, but, yeah, I just wanted to take it all in. I just so energy charged. Uh, I was like, all right, let's go. Next, you know, first match. Where's my first match? Um, and like I wasn't the first match out the door. And I was like, oh, man. all right, come on, I got to get out. You know, I got to get out there and just and then feel feeding off the energy of the crowd because those the ECW fans are so loyal to us. And, yeah. You know, we they were there for us as much as we were for them. Uh, right. But and, you just feel that energy between the two. Right. And the fans play such an integral part in helping get it, you know, going. I mean, they the, the backing and the support and the petitions and everything else to get it there. And then there's all the, you know, there's obviously that, you know, all the stories of oh, the generator going out just immediately when it's <laughs> off air and and this. Uh, but when it was done, when it was all said and done, bam, they're off the pay-per-view. They say the generators go out, right, and everything. Was the locker room just like, take a breath? I'm like, holy shit, we just did it. We did it. Yeah. We, we pulled oh, it yeah. off. And what, I mean, what was that feeling like after? I mean, that had to be euphoric almost. Oh, yeah. It was it was celebrating winning the Stanley Cup or, you know, the major, you know, winning the World Series or something like that. We, we, we achieved our goal. Um, I don't know if guys had thought of goals beyond that but mm-hmm. as a company we were like this is what we're trying to do we're trying to get on pay-per-view and show them we can do it too and we got on and we we showed them we we did it and the, you know we're we're something else to to reckon with <laughs> not never yeah not not a huge enemy but we're, we're here and we're not going anywhere yeah and there were obviously there were more pay-per-views right there was the, the weekly tv kept on and eventually then Right, there started to be struggles, but then ECW landed on TNN with a second show. Some there's there's often there's mixed mixed feelings right here. Some people say by that time, uh, it's too little, too late. We already knew things were starting to roll downhill. Then there were some people who thought this could be our savior, right? TNN mm-hmm. could be our savior. What was your perception like at that time when the TNN deal came? Where did you fall? I didn't know if they would be our savior, but I thought it was our next step. I, I thought it, so it was we had to level up to uh, a larger span, a larger broad, a larger audience. Yeah. Um, we weren't getting syndicated everywhere. Um, it also upgraded our look if, mm-hmm. if we were in a, a you know a, an arena setting as opposed to a you know rec center. Mm-hmm. Or, or things like that. And, and trust me, we made some of those places look great compared <laughs> right. to what they really were. Yeah. Um, but I thought it was the next step up in, in the progression of the company. Um, 
I knew that some things had to be pulled back, but I still felt that we could get away with our our theory of extreme wrestling. Sure. Well, um, and, and and how quickly though did you see? Because obviously TNN wound up not being very supportive, right? There wasn't a lot of promotion. Right. They weren't really pushed back backing. So how quickly did did you and, and the guys start noticing that? Okay, what what's going on here? We're on this channel, but they don't seem to be kind of backing us very well. Yeah, we'd done a TV taping and and they didn't like it for some reason. I I don't know why. And it was not in a small place. It was in a a convention center, so it was a decent building. Um, and I thought the matches were fine. I don't know what they didn't like about the camera angles or the editing or the sound or the the lights or whatever. Um, so the first couple of weeks we just we showed old stuff. Yeah, and, and I was like, wow, I hope that's not a mistake. Um, and that's when the, the fight began. Uh, then we did a TV taping down in Nashville that I thought had a great look. Big building, um, in, intense matches. Um, I felt like we were, the, the, the locker room stepped up a level with how we were treated. And I think, you know, those two things needed to come together. That need, needed to, we needed to step up both at the same time. And I, I just thought, okay, this is cool. Now, you know, we'll stay, we'll be here. We'll, we can do it like this. Then we were back to, you know, we'll just use the, the arena tapes. Nothing wrong with the arena tapes, but it became, well, we'll just use the regular TV. And, and from then I got the sense that since there was no one from TNN coming around to watch us to see what we're doing, um, I was like, eh, this doesn't sound, this, this isn't going to last too long. Um, and then we got the, you know, uh, well, WWE is negotiating to come in. I'm like, oh, we're just, you know, we're, we're yeah. just crash test dummies. Sure. Right. Yeah. I mean, there was a lot of, I mean, and, and, it, and it's, it's a little shame, right? Cause ECW, there was a lot clicking at this time, right? There was a magazine, there were figures, there was a video games, video game. Yeah. Yep. And if they, it's just, if they could have, you know, got on the right channel that would have been supportive of, okay, this, yeah, this is a new, a different product, a new product. Let's let's run with it. You know, who knows? You know, because but by this time, ECW was it's like they were running just to pay for the next step, right? right. The pay-per-views were, were running. So it's almost they they needed something and they didn't they didn't get it. Um when when things were struggling there, did did you encounter any of those pay issues that guys talk about so much? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> we get yeah. we would get a paycheck on on Saturday, fly home Sunday. And at the bank, the closest bank of New York you could find, because that's what the checks were written on, yep. and get there before someone else does yep. and cash your check. You know, we, we'd get, sign guy and I lived, lived close to each other, That then we'd hop in the car and take off, and they'd say, well, there, there's not enough money in the bank. Like, ah, Jack Victory was here before us. <laughs> yeah, that's what I, uh, I talked to Bill Wiles, and that's what he was saying, right? As soon as they got that check, it's like, yeah. bam, let's, let's get to the bank. Try to be the first guys there because they, yeah, you know. I mean, there, there was one night we were in Wichita, Kansas, and, and they kept saying, Checks are coming in, checks are coming, in, checks. We're flying the checks in, they're, they're coming to you. And, and Paulie wasn't there, Tommy was running the show. It was when, when Paulie was, you know, negotiating yeah. with, um, <laughs> with Fox. Yeah. And so his assistant, I drove her that, that day. And that night we sat at the Wichita airport till like one o'clock in the morning. When the last FedEx plane came in, and there was no package for us, and, and people think that poor, poor Debbie Beaumont, she, she's passed away since, but people think that she knew everything that was going on. Well, if she knew what was going on. We weren't going to be sitting at the airport till one o'clock in the morning and yeah. drive to Kansas to catch a seven thirty flight that morning. Yeah. Um. So yeah, it's just you know, it's a lot to that and coming home and saying, well, all I have are my, my draws. There's there, here's a check. I don't know if it's any good. That, that didn't help any either. Yeah. Man, and, and so how smooth was Paul to, to BS and the guys, right? Cause <laughs> I I've seen video even after ECW had folded that of guys like Ball Mahoney, balls Mahoney doing these shows saying, Oh, I still think it's, there's, I still think it's going to come back. I still think something's going to happen. There's still, I mean, some of these guys, it's, and, and I love, you know, no offense to balls and, you know, rest in peace and everything else, but some of these guys were really, truly believed. Yeah. Thing. So, 
how good was Paul at selling this stuff? At oh, all he, these guys in circles. You know, the the last the last time that we had seen him, I guess, was the massacre on Thirty Fourth Street pay per view. And guys, I'm 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 working as hard as I can. I'm out there. I'm, I'm talking to this network and that network, and and we're we're really close to getting something done. Just please hang in there. And he was great at it. And I think most of the guys were hanging in there because a lot of them probably didn't think that, you know, WWE or WCW or, you know, TNA or whoever was, you know, coming along at the time yeah. um, next to WWE weren't going to take them. Um, yeah, I know. I knew I didn't think somebody was going to take me. Um, and I had gone back to to working a, a regular job during the week. I had been working in promotions for the company. Um, and I was like, well, they're not sending me anywhere. I better go find something else to do. Yeah. And was, do this uh, on the weekends. What was Tommy Dreamer? Was he in an awkward position with this? Oh, yeah. I mean, was he trying to to spread the BS? Was he how, what was he doing? I mean, how how in touch was he with what was happening? Um, I think he knew more than letting us know. And I think he was trying to be a buffer between anybody killing Paul. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um and and i think he wanted to keep it going too i i think he was willing to that if some if he had found a way to save the company he would have and would have taken and would have taken sure. it over right he he was you know he drank the kool-aid just as much as anybody else did but i sure. i think he you know he he probably knew a little bit more and and probably didn't drink as much kool-aid as, as some mm -hmm. of us <laughs> yeah were, were you at the last ecw show in pine bluff arkansas I was. What what was what was it like? I mean, because you know there was the send off kind of at the end, and everybody kind of right. knew. What so what was the what was the morale in the locker room there? Uh, I I think that it was half and half. I think it got half the guys were saying, "Well, it was good while it lasted," and I think half of them were like, "Well, you know, we'll see what happens." We we still have there were there were a couple of shows scheduled. I think there was a pay per view scheduled, and mm -hmm. I don't know, mm -hmm. maybe we'll you know we'll all meet at the pay per view, and then that that got killed um so it, i think it was kind of half and half uh, you know guys holding on it was it was their dream too as much as it was paul's yeah did, did you ever get any official word did anybody ever call you and say hey jim yeah we're done that's it there's not no. gonna be any more or did you just because you never got another call you just knew and just not until you know i kept hearing hold on hold on hold on we'll we'll get something done and the pay-per-view was canceled and that that's when i thought that ah, we're done um, you know, was, was Paul going to work, um, as an announcer for WWE and be able to, to fund ECW and let him, you know, let us do our thing on the weekends, you know, maybe that could have happened. I don't know. Um, that was a hope. Yeah. Um, but that was that around that was when I was like, yeah, we got to go back into the real world. Yeah. Do you, do you think there was anything I, there's obviously a lot of factors involved, but do you think there was what what was something that maybe could have been tweaked or changed that maybe could have prevented the downfall? Do you do you? I mean, I've heard people talk that hey, it was too big, too quick, and, and then they there was a, but then there's some people just say hey, it's just a victim of circumstance, right? It was too big to be small and not big enough to be big, and it's just it is what it is, and it just happened. There's not yeah, much I I think it's really a combination of the two. I I, th I think we wanted to grow, but we couldn't. Um, and we were just, you know, the, and the situations were, were changing that I always say that, that if, if it wasn't for the, for the Clinton administration, ECW wouldn't have been around if it had <laughs> been a more tight knit, um, <laughs> hardcore, you know, right wing Republican party. I don't think we would have been on TV. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. Maybe not. They would have and, shut and that with, down. <laughs> and with you know, with with someone coming in after after Clinton, I was like, we're not going to be able to do that anymore. Yeah, congressional hearings on ECW and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so, like I said, you were there through the whole thing, right? The whole mm -hmm. of, the, of the original ECW. Let's just talk about focus on that. What are there any matches that really jump out at you and stand out as your favorites? Give give us an example of something. Um, I don't look them in. Uh, there are some that are my favorite. Uh, my favorites are working with uh, Eddie Guerrero and Dean Malenko and and Jerry Lynn and Lance Storm. Same type of match. Um, great guys to work with. Had fun with them. 
Um, but I look at some of the matches that I did that I felt were important to the company. Um, I did the three-way match, th- the triple threat match or whatever you would call them nowadays, uh, between Shane Douglas, Sabu, and Terry Funk. Mm-hmm. Like the line was crossed. 60-minute yep. Broadway. Yep. Uh, I, I think that got us on the worldwide um, take trader market. Mm-hmm. That's re- that's what really put us on the the target of wrestling fans. Wow, I heard they had this great match in Philadelphia that went 60 minutes and nobody won. But I got to see it. Um, and then after that, I think the next step up was barely legal. Mm-hmm. And um, I got to do the Sabu tab- uh, Taz match where the buildup, if you go back and watch the buildup, they didn't touch each other for two years. Yeah. And it, it was amazing. Uh, and I, I thought that that was something that was, you know, that just that whole night was important to the company. But that was supposed wasn't the main event, but it was the main attraction of, of the evening. Sure. And uh, you hear lots of wild stories about ECW, right? And I know maybe your approach is a little different, right? Because you were you weren't a single guy. Uh, maybe having as much fun as some of these other guys. But do you have, and I'm not saying, let's, you know, I'm not saying it has to be in that way, but do you have an ECW story that maybe you haven't talked about or say, and again, I'm not trying to break up anybody's marriages out there or anything else, <laughs> but is there, is there something maybe a little more non-wrestling related, something fun, uh, maybe a story that you could, that you have to share? Um, I've, I, it's not one that I haven't told, but I've told this before. Okay. Um, <laughs> um, for, I, I drove a lot of the people, a lot of the guys. Mm-hmm. Um, just because Paul trusted me because I, I wasn't drinking. I I didn't drink, so obviously I didn't hang out with a lot of that stuff going on. Sure. Um, so uh we had turned down um Paul turned down China to come into ECW. Didn't think it was a fit. Uh-huh. And then China became a hit at um at WWE. So he was like, hmm, what do I do? So he brings in the world's largest female bodybuilder from the Howard Stern show. Nicole Bass. Nicole Bass. <laughs> <laughs> so we were doing a, a run in Louisiana and Paul said, can you drive Nicole Bass around with you that weekend? Oh. Okay. <laughs> and she very nice person, very sweet lady, had no problems with her. Uh, so it was myself. And I said I used to drive Debbie Beaumont, who was Paul's assistant. Um, mm-hmm. People would know her as the nasty ticket lady at the <laughs> at the box <laughs> office. <laughs> um, so so we're driving, and we I pull into my, my McDonald's, and, and there's another story tied into the McDonald's. Um, and we're driving along, and uh, I like classic rock, and so born to be wild is playing. <laughs> so pull into McDonald's, get out. <laughs> and turn the key off and Debbie and I get out and in the car, we can still hear. The worst rendition of born to be what you've ever heard. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> but, but the time, the McDonald's thing at the time, beanie babies were the hot thing. Uh-huh. And McDonald's had beanie babies in their kitty, their kid meals. <laughs> yeah. Al Snow and I were getting beanie babies for our kids. <laughs> so we're eating kids meals <laughs> and when we meet up at the show we're exchanging beanie babies <laughs> wouldn't what? expect that an ecw Why? show a, a, a beanie well okay, again that's so 90s <laughs> a, a beanie that's baby so not ecw too absolutely i have how many kids meals did al snow we just, <laughs> just to, to fill him up <laughs> <laughs> right right <laughs> oh a beanie baby exchanges in an ECW show with you and else though. That's <laughs> that's great. Oh man. Um wow. So you you've also worked some of the reunion show since, right? You did you did appear in the WWE ECW, correct? Yes. They're the only ones I've done. Oh, just the WWE ECW. Yep. You didn't do any of the hardcore homecomings or any of those, right? No. Nope. I did not. Nope. Okay, so there was there was obviously a lot of misses about the WWE ECW, but but lots of people talk about the first one night stand mm-hmm. as really probably being the closest post ECW thing to capturing the the feel and the spirit. Would you agree with that? 
Absolutely. I think that was our ability. And I think we pulled it off um, to say thank you to the fans and say goodbye. I yeah. think if we, if it had ended there with no WWE ECW, it, it would have been great. I I, I just um, there was a meeting beforehand, and Vince McMahon came in and said, "Guys, go out there and give them the show that they're expecting," and we did. Yeah, yeah. I don't. I I'm I'm not a fan of the sci-fi run, uh, the WWE ECW. I I feel like I, I feel I don't know. There was a mixed opinion. I feel like Vince was trying to trying to undercut the 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 brand of ECW a mm-hmm. little bit with it. Um, it, obviously, you know it's it's conjectured. I mean, no one's going to know unless he ever came out and said. But um, I feel like he's got his hands full with other things right now that I don't I don't believe that's a priority for him at the moment. But <laughs> but yeah, obviously the one would, I think he would have been I think he would have done the same thing if they had done a, a WCW show. Sure, he absolutely undermined the the name. The, yeah, which is is wild to me because. There's no more, it's no more, it's not a competition anymore, right? right. You, you, you own it. Why not? You won. Why not? Tr- yeah. Why not try to use the value it has instead of just, I mean, you've already proven that you're, you're the product. Right. And you now, but you know, whatever, that's, that's a whole different story. Um, <laughs> But what uh, are you, you talk to, you, you're still out there working, right? You still do some shows, mm-hmm. uh, uh, lots of appearances, different things. Um. Who are some of the guys from ECW that you're still close with? Um, I, I know, I think you and John Finnegan still, you know, you're still pretty close, right? Yeah, it's yeah. We, to... It's funny. We've always lived no less than five miles away from each other <laughs> <laughs> since we've we've known each other. Yeah, and um, obviously John John was there for the entire ECW run as well. I mean, right, right. I, I, I don't, you and John, I think it's it, right? There's no other talent. Right, that was it. We're the only two that, that made yeah, it from without leaving and coming back. A lot of right, guys sure. left and came back. Sure, we're the yeah. only ones who are there from day one to the end of it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I see him every once in a while. He he only rest or uh, wrestle. He only referees um, for a company called ECWA, mm-hmm. sure. um, and they run about five show five six shows a year. Uh, I work for them occasionally when they need me. I'm I'm there. Yeah. Um, the guy the guy bought my wrestling ring from me, so <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm there. I'm happy to work for him. Um, but yeah, him, Mike Keener. The other uh, the referee that we had at the end mm-hmm. of the run of the original ECW, mm-hmm. uh, we're close. Uh, yeah, since I've gotten back in the ring, because I took a long time where I didn't do anything um, in front of the ring, in front of the people, um, yeah. I've hooked up with a lot of the guys. Lo- AC Loke. Um, I've always been good friends with Paul Richard, if you remember him as a mm-hmm. referee with ECW. Mm-hmm. Um, Paul and I are, are very good friends. Um but yeah, local. I, I, it's more of the local guys, uh, you know, that you see at the the fan fest. Francine, I'm very good friends with. Talk to her yeah. a lot. Yeah. Um, she only lives like a half hour away from me, so uh, we were pretty, pretty friendly. Yeah, it's always. I mean, that's not even non ECW. It's always been a trademark of pro wrestling, right? A guy, guy you worked with in a territory or an area for years, and then you don't see each other for twenty or thirty years or whatever, right. and you show up at a convention, and it's just like. Like you never missed a step, right? You're just right. good, you know, and everything else. So, um, it, it, like you, you've done a lot of other things, right? You, I mean, you promoted shows, you've ran your, yeah, lot, done lots. Of, I mean, dabbled in lots of different things. Um, is, is refereeing still a passion for you, though? I mean, do you, is that where you still get a lot of enjoyment from from getting out there and doing it? Um, yeah, yeah, it has. Um, I, I, I took a long time off from being in the ring. Um, I ran, I helped run the Monster Factory for a while. And then just so the story doesn't go on, just kind of split off in different directions. And the promotion that we had with the Monster Factory, the, the matches themselves, we called OTW, Old Time Wrestling. Right. Um, yep. So we kind of split. We went and had our own school and and promotion and did that for a, while. I had a, a business partner with me who moved back to Canada. And um, so for like a 15 year run, um, I did Monster Factory and OTW and promoted helped train, ran the place. Um, and it just came, got to be too much because I was doing too much on my own. Um, mm-hmm. The days of a show, I I uh, get up at seven o'clock in the morning, go get the rental truck at, at nine o'clock, get a crew to load it up, go do the show, you know, and then I'm not home again until two o'clock in the morning. It, too long for a guy m- my age. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and there were other factors, some, some, um, 
health factors. I had had a heart attack and I was just, you know, uh, let's slow it down. So I mentioned ECWA, the guys bought my ring and they were like, Hey, do you want a ref? You, first time you and John have worked together since the, the, the second one night stand. I'm like, yeah, that's cool. Let, you know, I'll do that. So it was a super eight. They run a super eight every year. Sure. Yeah. They're, they're known right. for. Yeah. Um, so I, I did that and worked for them a little bit. And that was when the passion came back. And, and what I like about it is that I can be in the ring and feel that emotion again with, wow, we got the crowd with, you know, you guys have the crowd with you. Let, mm -hmm. Let's, let's really bring them in. Yeah. Um, and, and I'm able to give feedback afterward, you know, where, where I think I wasn't, I was giving feedback and I don't think it was guys were uh, that set on what I had to say, but now that I'm in the ring and right there with them and can feel it, I think they, they, they take it a little more than, than I did just, you know, the old guy standing over there in the corner watching matches. Yeah. When, when I talked to John, I, I kind of, I don't want to say give him a hard time, but uh, you guys <laughs> a, a couple of different times have, have tried podcasting and I always enjoyed yeah. it. I, I mean, you and John did one and then you, uh, you did one with Joel Goodart there for a while. Mm -hmm. and, and there was someone else who was the third. I'm not, I can't remember who the third was in that. Well, I'm, I'm doing one now with uh, Mike Freeland. And uh -huh. uh, okay. and the, he has front row material, and part of the show is yeah. called uh, Front Row Referee. Okay, so it's myself and uh, Nick Papa Giulio who who mm -hmm. does uh, local stuff here in the Jersey, the Philadelphia area, and we'll switch guys in and out. Um, but that's what we I've been doing lately. That's uh, once a week. Yeah, we've been a little slow lately because of you know different thing, you know, personal life stuff. So we slowed yeah. it down a little bit. But yeah, it's fun to do. I like doing it. I, yeah, I think I got. I, I think referees have a voice that needs to be heard out there, whether it's sure. myself or Kyoto or whoever is is doing a podcast. Um, yeah, there's there's several they, out there doing them now. And, yeah, uh, there, there's there. It's a different a different set of eyes on on yeah, pieces it's, it's of nice. history. Yeah, because referees are often underappreciated, right? Because um, you know, so many people they don't notice the referee or whatever else and don't realize, Hey, that's, that's the key, right? Sure. That's, that's right. That's, and, that's and right. What yeah. I like about that, that, that direction is that if someone doesn't know I did a match, it, you know, it could be the biggest match in, you know, in, in the history of, of professional wrestling. If they don't know I did that match, I did my job. Sure. Absolutely. Yeah. It's, it's such an underappreciated position and, and, and in its importance, people often forget there's a third man in that ring. Right. And, um, and, it, and, and it's important. Uh, like we said, though, you, you do lots of appearances, lots of convention stuff. Anything planned? Because obviously WrestleMania weekends in Philly this year. Right. Um, what all, do you have anything on your on your slate yet for WrestleMania I had, weekend? I had one thing set up, and it, it actually just got canceled. So I'm actually talking wow. to uh, the WrestleCon folks about doing something. They've got some things planned that they haven't announced yet. So um, I'm talking to them about doing some of that stuff. Um, a company called SPO Wrestling, uh, Superpowers of Wrestling, uh, which is run by Johnny Cashmere from the uh, oh, sure. Backstreet Boys. Backstreet Boys um, yeah. yeah, they run um, Sunday afternoons. Um, it's every six weeks or so. And I've been working with them. So they're actually running that Sunday of WrestleMania. And they do afternoon shows. So if, if you're in the South Jersey area, it's probably about a half hour away from uh, where WrestleMania will be at, at two thirty. Look it up, SPO Wrestling. Uh, but that's the only thing in stone so far. But like I said, I got some things brewing, and you know, there's still plenty of time to, to announce sure. them. Yeah, I mean, it's gonna be obviously a fun weekend. Uh, lots of speculation, right? With it being in Philly, there's there's no Hall of Fame announcement. So what's going to go on? Lots of talk. I know Sandman supposedly assigned a Legends deal. Was that gonna, you know, is that going to be something Hall of Fame related involved? You know. It, it, none of that's come out yet, but it's obviously a lot of excitement for ECW fans with right. WrestleMania weekend yeah. being in Philly and, and what's going to happen. Uh, lots of shows, obviously, paying tribute to ECW on that weekend, some of the indie shows. So, uh, it's, so it's a good time for ECW fans uh, on that weekend. So, but if people want to keep up with you in your, like you said, you're doing a lot, you do lots of appearances, conventions, you're still out there, referee, uh, doing you, seminars you, too. Doing you, seminars, you you got you're the an podcast indie company, looking uh, lots for of, you know, referee yeah, seminars. You, you got lots of shirts. I mean, you got shirts available. You got all kinds of stuff going on out there. Uh, what is the best way for someone that wants to follow you to to see what Jim's got going on and to keep track of all this? What's the best way for them to follow you? The easiest way is on Twitter or X, whatever you want to call it. Sure, and it's yeah. it's easy enough. It's at 
Jim Molino, and it's J I M M O L I N E A U X, all yep. lowercase. Um, you can catch me on there. Um, if you want to contact me, it has my email there. Yeah. Um, I'm on Facebook, um, pretty much the same, same way, Jim Molino. Um, and that's really it. I, I have Instagram, but I just like, I only have it because I have to do things. I do things like this on Instagram mm. sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't, I don't post anything. <laughs> so if you want to follow me, have, have a go at it, but I really don't do anything on there. Yeah. So everybody go, go follow Jim on X on, on Twitter, X, whatever it's called now. I, I still Twitter to me. Yeah. Um, because obviously, you know, anything you've got, you'll, I'm sure you'll post there or share the shows, you know, for, that's being posted so you can keep track of what you're doing there. Uh, like I said, he's got some shirts, go out there and, you know, buy some shirts. If you've got a company out there, would like to bring in Jim to do a seminar. Contact him. He said the email is in your bio on X to reach yep. out for booking inquiries. Uh, but Jim, thank you for your time. Uh, like I said, we just kind of, this is kind of an overview. Uh, but man, there's so much for you to talk about. Cause like I said, you and John, the only guys there from beginning to end. So I feel like at some point we need to do another one and, and dive in a little more detail to some more specific events and matches and things like that and less of an overview. So I think we got to have you back on the show again in the future and really That's dive in. It was a great talk. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, thank you for your time, Jim. Like I said, down the road, I'll be back in touch. We'll do we'll do a follow up, dig a little deeper. So. All right. Great. Support This Is Extreme and buy the This Is Extreme shirt. Show the world that you are part of the revolution and that you support our podcast and the history of ECW. Go to tinyurl.com slash ECW pod shirt and buy yours today. All right, and we are back on This is Extreme. I am Dave Dunnesty. Thank you to Jim Molino for joining me for that wonderful, wonderful interview. And hey, guys, if you'd like to hear some more of me, if you just can't get enough old Dave Dynasty in your life, make sure you check out my other podcast. I have the Wrestling Nostalgia Podcast, where I talk about uh, other wrestling history that's not ECW. There's a lot of, I try to I hone in quite a bit on the Midwest, the WWA, Dick the Bruiser stuff, because that is kind of my, my key prime interest in wrestling. But I talk about a lot of stuff, but it's a lot of wrestling history. And as the title states, wrestling nostalgia. If you're into horror movies, check out my horror movie podcast. Listen to their screams. We review horror movies on there. We play games. We talk about uh, horror news and birthday and uh, movie anniversaries, all kinds of fun stuff. So check that out. It's called Listen to Their Screams. Make sure you subscribe to those. And uh, whatever podcast platform you like, make sure you're subscribing to this podcast there as well. And if the option is there, please give us a rating and review as that helps us in those algorithms. It helps us come up when people are listening to other shows. Uh, we appreciate all your support. We appreciate all your sharing, your responses, your likes on social media, uh, listening to the podcast and everything else. It is truly, truly uh, meaningful to us. And it's what helps the show grow, helps the show network and, and you know, expand our base. Uh, so thank you for doing that. And until next time, wherever you go, whatever you do, be good, be safe, and always keep it extreme.